Nice. Hey everyone and welcome to week eight of OLS 7, the seventh cohort of uh, training that we have run on open research methods and practices and community building. Um, so today we are focusing on inclusion related methods uh, and ways to bring contributors in to your community. Um, so we will have a couple of speakers today. We will have a breakout room and we will be um, working together with some silent reflections as well in the etherpad. So hopefully um, Aman, my fantastic co-host, uh, can you give us a wave? Right, he will be helping out as well, hosting some of the sections and posting, um, and he can also answer queries as we're going along as well. Um, and I'm going to do some of our standard reminders and then hop straight into it. So first things first, we have a code of conduct in OLS. Uh, there is more detail than I can go to I go into um, very briefly now. However, um, as a general rule, we ask that you treat one another with the respect that you would like to receive. Um, there is more to it than that. If you're looking at the etherpad, it's 946 um, openlifesci.org slash code of conduct. Um, I have just unmuted someone who's giving some background noise. You're always welcome to unmute to chat, um, but we just prefer to stop uh, accidental background noises coming through. Um, where else? Okay, code of conduct. All right, if you experience or witness something that you... We can hear you, yeah. Sorry, Sandrine, I'm not sure if you're talking to us. Okay, <laughs> we're good. <laughs> All righty. Um, yes, if you experience or witness unacceptable behavior, um, you can email the OLS organizers. Uh, team at openlifesci.org will reach um, all of the staff in OLS if you prefer something a bit more private for any reason whatsoever. We have our individual email addresses on line 48. Um, so that's Paz at openlifesci.org, Berenice, Malvika, Emmy, or Yo at openlifesci.org. We actually need to add one more to that because we have another recent hire we're working on the blog for. but. That's plenty for now. Um, hey, Sandrine. Hey, Aditi. Lovely to have you here. Um, anyway, uh, we're talking about inclusive communities, um, and we would be absolutely remiss if we did not look back to um, some of the teachings of our parent organization, Mozilla, around community engagement and the mountain or matrix of engagement. So I am really delighted to have an old friend here, um, Zana. Uh, Tell us also just a little bit about what you're doing these days, um, but I'll let you introduce yourself and do the talking. Sure. Um, I have some slides. Do you want me to um, put them on? Or... Yeah, that would be fab. I think I got mass muted. Okay, I'm back. All right, let me um, share my screen. And, um, and then do you all see a slideshow now? Great, awesome. You see it? Uh, no. no. We saw it, it and then it disappeared. And it went. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> okay, all right, let me, let me stop. Uh, off that and then um, I'm going to share my desktop and we'll try it again. How about that? Fabulous. Yes. Great. Okay, great. All right. So um, I am Zana Marsh. I am a facilitator, writer, and designer. And um, for about seven years, I worked at the tech nonprofit Mozilla. Um, helping to design and manage open source um, collaborative programs and resources, um, including the Mozilla Science Lab early on, um, the Global Sprint, which was a worldwide rolling hackathon, um, and MozFest, and I also worked on Mozilla's open leadership programs. Um, before that, I worked at um, a couple of um, museums and exhibit design firms. So I spent a lot of time thinking about learning experiences and narrative storytelling um, pathways. 
Um, and I left Mozilla last year and I'm actually currently writing a novel. <laughs> and I'm doing a little bit of consulting and illustration work. So um, things have changed for me. So it's really fun to come back here and talk about this work. Um, uh, I'm gonna do this presentation in English because that's the language that I speak best. Um, I'm gonna try to go slow and be clear. And I know that sometimes um, over um, uh, Zoom, things get lost. So we do have speaker notes and I can share them later if people are interested in seeing the written version of this. And you'll see me looking down a little bit because that's where my iPad is. Um, okay, um, today I'm gonna talk about the mountain of engagement, which is a way of um, thinking about community and open source uh, projects. Um, this notion came out of the work we did at Mozilla, and it was really, um, I think, um, best articulated by my former colleagues, um, Chad and Abby, um, and this oh. maybe slide we missed, remixed from their work. Um, so um, I'm going to go to the next slide. Um, so what is a mountain of engagement? Um, are you guys seeing the next slide? Can I get a thumbs up? Great. Okay, awesome. Um, here's a graphic by my colleague, Abigail Kavanaugh makes Maze, aka Abby Cavs. Um, and it shows that the amount of engagement um, is a metaphor for, um, and it's also a system for um, bringing newcomers into your project and your community and then leveling them up into leadership roles. Um, and we're going to talk about this a lot more. But before we dive in, I was just wondering, like, why, why engage? What will community offer you? And um, I can't see the chat, but I would love it if people would just, if you have a thought just in the next couple seconds, you know, what, what are you hoping your community will offer you? And we're gonna talk about this, I think later on in breakout groups. So this is a little preview, but if anyone has any thoughts immediately about what they're looking for from community, can they put them in the chat? And can someone read if anything comes into the chat? I'll read the chat. Um, folks, we'll just pause for a moment and give you a chance to think and type. Super low pressure, no, 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 uh, don't have to write anything big if it's just something small. Uh, so and from Carolina, we have um, ideas, new strategies and common interests. Nice. And Danny, uh, oh, we've got a bunch coming in. Thank you, lovely, lovely humans. We've got Danny saying, sharing experience that you might otherwise not have had yourself. I love that one. Different experiences and solutions to problems. Uh, yeah, ideas different from mine. Thank you, Claudia and Sarah. Uh, Mike says, shared solutions to common obstacles. These, these answers are gold. Thank you, folks. Nice. Um, and then next, what will you offer your community in return? It's always something to think about. So if you have any thoughts about that, drop them in and we'll just hear like two or three of those thoughts. And actually this one is hard. <laughs> Okay, maybe we're getting a couple answers. It's not surprising, this is much harder. And we'll talk about that also a little bit later. I think you maybe got one answer. I can see the chat number change. Do you want to read? Um, yeah, Danny's brought this one in. The same, but also attention and kindness. So I, I like yeah. that one. Nice. Nice. Someone they can talk with from Carolina. Great. Support in organizing. Thank you, Diana. Nice, perfect. Okay, you can keep putting these in there, but we're gonna we're going to move on. Um, and I just want to say, when you think about your mountain of engagement, that pathway to leadership, um, it should be really grounded in that why, what you need and what your community needs. Um, and I think for a lot of organizations, they kind of know community is good. We want community. We need community. Um, and so a lot of times um, projects, organizations, institutions will reach out to community without a really clear idea of um, what they need or how they want to use input and um, and what that and what the relationship could do for community members. And so sometimes when you haven't thought about it carefully, um, you can get sort of shallow engagements, feedback that comes in from community that nobody really knows what to do with. 
um, something that gets disregarded or ends up not being relevant or just these kind of odd interactions. And I know that's happened for me sometimes when I've tried to participate in projects. And I know I've run projects when we didn't really quite think through what we were gonna do with the community feedback. And so um, uh, the community never really gelled. So um, I'm sure that you, you'll talk about this and you know your intentions and missions in your project and how to involve community in lots of other moments at this cohort, but I think it just bears repeating, you know, ground your strategies for engagement in, in meaningful work with community. Um, so let's get back to that mountain. So the mountain is like this pathway to community leadership. And it starts with discovery, the very first moment that somebody interacts with your project, finds out about it. And then that first contact with someone at your project who, you know, has a task or a message or a way for you to join or some information to share through maybe that first moment of participation where you're able to, um, uh, a new community member is able to, to do something, to review something, to read something, to provide feedback into sustained participation, network leadership, um, and then leadership of your project. So this is a sort of beautiful upward slope um, that is the mountain of engagement. Um, and we'll talk also a bit, oh, where's my slider? Oh, oh, slides are a little slow, um, about how to make that happen. There are tons of tools and resources and sort of activities that my colleagues and I at Mozilla developed as ways of thinking about how to bring people in. So um, marketing, how are you sharing the message for that discovery phase? Um, is there a public GitHub repository? Is there an open source license? Um, when you're beginning to contact people, what communication channels are you using? Is there a readme where people can discover something about the project? Um, there's all these different practices and resources to use um, as you level up um, and learn more and more about, uh, as community members learn more and more about the project and become more and more involved. Um, and grow into what is hopefully a leadership role, right? And I'm just gonna say, again, this is a potential pathway. These are possible resources and it's really like a, not a one size fits all. It's more a little bit more of a, um, a guideline and mix and match skills um, and resources to do this work. Um, and I also wanna say that doing community work is a cycle. You don't do it just one time all at once, right? You invite people in, you onboard them, you empower them, you review their work, you recognize them and appreciate them. Then you renew your contact with them and say, hey, like maybe I can invite you to something else, you know? And at the, and at the same time, you'll probably have some other new people coming in. So it's this, it's this, it's cyclical, cyclical work, you know? So I love how we have circles and this like slope triangle, and these very visual. Um, resources as part of the slide deck that um, came from Abby and Chad. So it's great to um, remember this, that it's not, it's something that, that you'll continue to do over time. And it's great to start slow. You don't have to, you know, build a ton of community programs and inputs all at once. You can start slow and build slowly. Um, and, um, you know, build the community at the pace that's right for you. Um, and, and I think that that's the best. It's really easy to get overwhelmed. I have done it before, like came up with this great idea for a program, brought in a bunch of mentors, had the mentors connect you with other people, had an alumni program, and then suddenly it became like way, way too much. So think about sustainable points of interaction. <laughs> um, and like, uh, yeah, just, just let, let, it, let it grow naturally. Yeah, don't feel don't feel pressured to do too much at once. Um, so uh, the um, mountain of engagement is also defined by parameters and interactions. So all these ingredients sort of go into your community, people and their stories, those value exchanges that we were just sort of brainstorming about, the values of your community itself. Is it open? Is it about justice? Is it about transformation? Is it about, um, you know, do you have a code of conduct about kindness and care? Um, the behaviors that different people do, 
uh, the recognitions you give people, contributions, decision-making practices, leadership opportunities. There's so much that goes in to your community. It can, can be a little bit um, overwhelming sometimes to think about these things all at once. So I know Chad has been talking about and experimenting with this matrix idea, a matrix of engagement. And so I made a little model matrix for a project that is not real, um, but it's also just a way to think about and explore community interactions. So at the top of this matrix, um, I have all my community members and these people have names, but you could also do them more generally um, in terms of like newcomers, more established um, community members. You could do it in a more um, overarching way. Um, and then on the side, I have some different parameters. I have engagement, value, value exchange for what we get from them, um, value exchange what they get from us, further learning opportunities. And then just starting to think about all these people, how they engaged and, um, and, what, and what, it, what, it, what it could mean and what are next steps. So for example, you could have someone pop into your community that just unexpectedly dropped by an event with a friend. And, um, and we can imagine what the value exchange might be for them. Suddenly they're in a new environment, they're meeting a bunch of people, they're networking, but we don't really know. And we don't know this person very well, so we don't know what they add to our community. So this is a reminder to check in with new people, listen and learn. Um, you can have someone coming in through GitHub and doing a, a pull request on a good first bug. Um, we can see maybe what the value exchange for us is, that there was a bug fix. And we could see um, maybe what a further learning opportunity for that person would be. Um, Someone who spent a little more time, for example, might be a newcomer who suddenly commented on the language on our website. They're pointing out maybe where we could improve some things for inclus inclusivity. There's clear value exchange for us. Perhaps the value exchange for them is that they've made a positive change and they feel validated and that the project will be more inclusive. Further learning opportunities, we could dive in and start a conversation with them. Hey, could you look at some other materials we have to review? We'd love to learn more from you. Um, I also want to say that sometimes you get people who come in to the community with really specialized high level skills. So they're not really coming in as a newcomer. Maybe someone that has a similar project and they'll come in and consult on strategy. Um, and, um, and suddenly we'll gain all this amazing perspective from that person. It's always good to stop and think, okay, well, what are we providing them? Um, and sometimes it's just, uh, you know, networking, a chance to share their skills new new contact, um, new contacts, something like that. But it's always good to think, even with people who are contributing on a higher level, what, what can we offer? What's happening? What's the value exchange? And if we don't know, we can always ask them. So I think um, something to underscore when you're working with communities, always have conversations with your community members, find out what it feels like to contribute. Um, uh, ask, you know, like how you can better serve them, what it, what was, what was meaningful to them, what's valuable, what would they like to learn? So this is just a little draft of a matrix that we might use um, to think about. Community. And you can put anything you want um, on, um, you know, on the side, all those parameters that were listed in the previous slide, your own parameters, you might, you might be thinking about lots of different things. So the matrix is just a tool to explore. Um, and I think I just have a few more slides. So let's look at this mountain again. It is, um, it's just such a great graphic and it's so simple. I love the arrows, newcomers come in and they just level right up. Um, you see first contact and you go all the way to leadership. And I did wanna say that in practice, this is my illustration, I made this last night. <laughs> like what's it really like to, to have people come in your community? People come in from all different directions. They'll come in with all different goals. They may not, come in exactly the way you expect them to, and they may not uh, travel the path you are expecting for them. So you may have people coming in with a really specific skill, skill and they just wanna share that and they'll never level up. They're happy like just you know helping you uh, debug a few first issues and sticking around on GitHub and making comments here and there. Um, but they may never be interested in, you know, coming to a larger event or organizing something. You can you can have people that will come in and just shoot right to the right to a leadership role and want to take over and do something big, and that's amazing. And you can also have people that like wander, come in, 
stay like intensely evolved for a year or so and then go off and climb another mountain in the distance you know so um a, a community is unpredictable we build structures and supports to allow people to participate but I think you also can't be rigid about your expectations for how people will move through. And so I just have a few final thoughts, which is listen and observe, watch how people move through, you know, build a model that works for you, be flexible, get to know people, find alignments between what people want and can do, um, and know that there are many paths. Um, it's important to meet people where they are. Um, you know, sometimes when I'll, I'll chat, when I was working at Mozilla and I would chat with a community member, I would find out, like, what's your life like right now? Like, what's new with you? Just in a, at the beginning of a call, just a friendly get to know. And sometimes people would be like, oh yeah, well, you know, I just got this huge new project or um, I'm changing jobs. And then I know, okay, like I'm not gonna ask this person or expect this person to put a ton of time into the projects right, right now because they're in a different place in their life. People's engagement ebb and flow. And so that's something as a community manager leader in an open source project, you have to understand. And it's totally fine when people leave. Sometimes people do what they wanted to do and then they just go off and do something else. Um, and you always have to think about bringing new people in and supporting those new people and finding ways for them to contribute in a way that's valuable. And I just wanna say a healthy community, community is a dynamic one and it's a fun and uh, kind of glorious and interesting bunch of work. And you just, um, you just need to be responsive to what people are, are doing and asking for. So that is the end of my slide deck. Um, you can reach me at this email address. Um, I'll, and then if anyone has any questions, I'm happy to share. And there's also just a couple um, resources that Chabby, Ch Chad and Abby created that are, that there's links here for them. So that's it. Thanks everybody. Can we have a quick round of camera and or emoji applause for Zana? Thank you so much, Zana. Um, I love how we get different perspectives every time, like just about the same talk happens. Um, and I see that even Falafel is applauding um, from his cage where he's being a very good boy. <laughs> Uh, folks, if you have any questions, um, please put them, um, you can put them in the chat here, you can put them in the etherpad, or if you're comfortable unmute unmuting and asking, then um, please do that, and we'll pause a moment and see what questions come in. Uh, line 67 for the questions, by the way. All right, I have one. Folks, if you have any more that you would like or that you think of, um, please uh, do add them in. Um, but Zana, um, what, uh, I guess I, I, I really, really appreciate it when you, you had the um, illustration from last night. Um, it really spoke to me because for example, it's really quite common um, that we find people in RLS will, maybe start as a mentor and they'll be like hey I enjoyed this can I be a mentee next time because I actually want the process of going through the structured thing and so it really it really spoke to me like it is not just like that it's like ooh, ooh. you know it's it's absolutely right plus like I was so delighted to already see the um license there uh <laughs> it's like yeah I'm gonna be reusing that one <laughs> thank you so much we have a couple of questions in the chat now this is fantastic um, yeah, and tough ones. Yeah. Okay, well, I'll, I'll, leave, I'll leave it to you. <laughs> yeah, I would say if you're being ignored by the community, I would, I would find out, um, I would think about how you're communicating and, and if you're communicating in the right channels, if you're communicating with the right language, and if you're finding the right people to reach out to. So, Mm, um, and I, having done community work for seven years at Mozilla, I have had that experience of sending out an email to crickets <laughs> and, uh, cr and crickets, that's an expression in English that means 
Um, you send something out into the into the world, and all you hear is the the, the sound of little bugs chirping in the distance. You don't you don't you don't get any responses from the people that you want to hear. So, um, yeah. So I would I would find out if you're using the right commun communication channels. Are you sending an email to a to a group that's primarily communicating on a different platform? Are you um, using language or describing your project in a way that maybe um, isn't the right angle for people to come in? Is the language you're using too complicated? Are you starting in the middle of the story instead of the beginning of the story? Um, are, you, um, are you telling the st a story that's really engaging to people about the project? Uh, sometimes you tend to focus, when you're in a project, you tend to focus on the parts that you see, maybe technical details, needing help with certain things. Maybe you need to step back and say, um, find a way to frame your project in a way that's uh, more accessible. Um, and then, um, I guess, looking more broadly at the people you're trying to reach and, and, and asking yourself if these are the right people. Um, uh, if there's some other section of the community that you're missing, if there's, uh, or if there's a person that you can find who's excited about your project, who can help you talk to the community who is more a part of that community. So those are some suggestions I would have. Um, how to deal with complicated members of the community. Uh, yes, yeah, so this is always tricky. Um, I think if I'm having difficulty with somebody or other people are having difficulty with somebody first um i just do a self check like uh if this person if this person is like why is this person difficult and what's difficult for me about dealing with this person and if i'm going to have a conversation with them about it who who a mentor or someone trusted who can i speak to about that my feelings about it not complaining about what the person did but um, oh, I'm going to go in and have a, a conversation with so-and-so and they always raise their voice and make a ton of points and I feel like I can't speak. So I'll have a strategy for going in and talking, maybe slowing down the conversation, maybe writing some notes first about what I want to say. So kind of preparing myself um, to have a conversation with someone who's complicated. Um, if somebody is... Um, other people in the community are having problems with this person. Then I try to approach the situation with empathy and ask myself, what is, where is this coming from? What's the complication coming from? Is the person struggling because they're not getting what they need? Um, is the information, um, is there information that's missing? Um, is there, uh, does this person feel like not recognized? Do they, what, what do they want? <laughs> um, that that they're not getting that is making them complicated, and sometimes you sometimes you can't solve that for people. Sometimes they want something that your project will never deliver. But if you take some time to look at those things, um, uh, and see, did they feel disrespected? Do they feel, you know, is there something that happened that is triggering them? Um, that's always a way to start. Um, and it's different for every situation, every community member. I hope that's helpful. Uh, is there anything, does anyone wanna, is there anything else I could say about that? I'm not sure. Those are useful answers. Okay, great. Awesome. Um, okay, yeah, all right. So uh, what is a good, communication tool or channel for a community taking into account usability. Um, this is always hard. Um, I would say go where your community already is. Um, so if everybody in your community uh, always uses Slack or Facebook or Mattermost or whatever, just go where people are. Um, and if, if you're starting a project, just go where people are <laughs> and 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 I would say use that. I mean, if you want, if you're if you're starting from complete scratch and you want to use, move people onto a new new platform, I think that's a different discussion. But um, 
Uh, I know at Mozilla, when I was at Mozilla, we always had a conversation about um, the problems and there's so many problems with tech platforms. I mean, they have usability issues, they have accessibility issues, they have privacy issues, they have security issues. Um, and, um, but I think it's what's most important is that you find where people are and go there to start. And then maybe when you have a community and, you, and you're thinking about moving, then have a big discussion with everybody. Where do you want to be? Because if you pick, pick a platform and nobody's there, uh, it doesn't matter. And I think like tons of people are on WhatsApp, Telegram, Signal. There's so many options. So um, yeah, it's a never, never, it's true. It's a never ending debate, but that, that would be my, my thought. Thank you so much, Zana. I have a feeling that we could keep on peppering you with questions, but I really, as much as I really would love to do that, we should move on um, and get into our breakout rooms. Uh, so one final big round of um, applause and thank you for um, Zana. Um, just a fantastic, fantastic talk and um, great answers to tricky questions. Um, so folks, for the breakout rooms, uh, just a quick reminder, we have two types of breakouts. Um, so you can either have a written breakout or a spoken breakout. This allows people to interact, uh, whether you prefer spoken uh, interactions or whether there's a reason that written may be easier. For example, if you're somewhere noisy or if you are hard of hearing or anything else like that. Um, so we request, um, if you can, most of you already have put in front of your names, either W or S. Um, and Aman is going to do the job of sorting us into these rooms whilst I just let us know what we're doing as part of these discussions. Um, so the discussion now is on value exchange, um, which Zena has introduced beautifully um, about the way, you know, think about what, what do you want to get when you work with community members and what do they get when they're working with you? Um, so we're going to invite you to talk with your uh, breakout roommates um, about what you think this might be. And if you're not sure, then this is a great time for maybe the other people who, who know what you're working with to suggest. Um, so we will have two or three people, um, so about three people in each room. Um, I'm sure I'm just going to keep on talking and make sure Aman has enough time to sort them all. Um, and we will give you about 10 to 15 minutes. We'll put a timer on that, uh, Aman. So if you can set the timer, for, I'm going to say mm, 13 minutes so that we can keep vaguely on time. Um, so that uh, means every... Mm? Yeah, just uh, I think we have a few folks who still have to assign, like have not added the SO to. And I'll just wait for a minute or so. Thank you so much. Um, so uh, folks, if you haven't added the S or the W, I'm going to assume that it's that you prefer written. Um, so um, if you could just act on that, uh, that would probably be a good idea. Um, as a general reminder, if you prefer um, written, then you can either use the Zoom chat or Etherpad. We don't see the Zoom chat when you're in the breakout room, so don't worry, you won't have a conversation with the whole world, it'll just be your breakout room. Um, but the Etherpad perhaps sometimes allows for, for a bit more nuance and conversation if you can reach the Etherpad. Um, right, and what we're actually going to talk about, the, these value exchanges, we have two or three prompts to help you think about it. Oh, um, oh, man, I was, no, no, okay, never mind. I'm getting confused. I'm getting so confused. Never mind. Ignore what I just said. Um, yes, the prompts. What things do you give to others? What do you get back? Um, and is the balance right to you? Or is the things, adjustments that you might like to make based on what you've just thought about when you've been talking to people? Is the assignment reasonably clear? I've got a nod from Mike. Thank you, Mike. Um, if you, and I've got lots of thumbs up. Oh, you're angels. Okay. Um, Aman, are we ready? Okay. Send them all away. 13 minutes. We are looking forward to this. We'll see you back soon. Yeah, I think everyone should have a notification from the breakout rooms and just waiting for a moment or two to see if anyone has any thoughts or reflections or things that you notice from the breakout room that you might want to share.
All right, I'll, I will go ahead and share Chukuka speaking. Go for it. All right, um, in our interaction in our breakout room, we were able to get to a, um, a stage or like a, a thought came up. Like, how do you handle situations where you tend to have a break in communication, like a misunderstanding in your community, whereby the community tend to not understand clearly what your project is all about, or situation where maybe like one of our or one of our breakout room members say you give a finger, they want an arm, that kind of a situation where they tend to drag you beyond your aim, like yes. So your M is at A to B or A to C, and then they're dragging you to F, and then you a, 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 a length where you didn't you your project is not uh, focused on. So the idea came that in such situation you may identify, stratify your community, identify the people, no matter how few they are, who have a, a better grab on your project interact with them and get them to buy in fully to your project and your aim and objectives and then they could help you interact with other members of the community making them understand what your um, project is all about to the extent that they all are cool with what you're doing and willing to contribute around uh, that is around the boundaries the project you have described in your own set. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, your audio was coming like a little bit quiet sometimes. I'm just going to quickly restate just to make sure um, in case people didn't catch uh, what was going on. Um, but if I understand correctly, you were talking about when you're working with someone and um, sometimes they don't necessarily have the shared vision that everyone has for the project. Uh, and they might want to take the project in directions that maybe weren't where you want it to go. Um, and then, um, if I understand correctly, you talked about the fact that um, as a group, one thing you can do is you can find people who do have that shared vision and empower them to share that vision with other people, effectively finding the core contributors and the allies who can help be the ambassadors for your work. Does that roughly sound right? Really? Thank you so much. I would love to ask for a few more reflections. Um, I don't want to uh, waste everyone's time and run over though. So um, we'll, we'll move on. Uh, please feel free to continue these discussions always in our Slack. Uh, if you had any particularly interesting insights or anything like that, then the Slack is a, a great place for, for this to work asynchronously. We have another um, alum of the Mozilla community who's come along to give us the next talk, however, and I was supposed to let Aman introduce her. Aman, over to you. <laughs> That's all right, yeah. Uh, so yeah, we, we have Meg here, who's going to talk about designing for inclusivity and how you introduce personas and pathways in a project. And after Meg's talk, we'll sort of do a reflection exercise to see what we think about that in context of our own experiences and projects and yeah looking forward to the talk and i'll let meg introduce herself okay great uh well let me go ahead and share my screen hello everyone happy to be here uh okay let's see slideshow thumbs up slideshow it's working yeah okay cool um well let, let me just say i am Super happy to be here um, for many reasons. One, um, to come right after Zana, who has been just an ultimate inspiration for me and my work. Um, so if there are any repeat slides, uh, we, we can uh, we, we can just know that you're getting double the, the information today. Um, but like Haman said, my name is Meg Doherty, and I'm going to talk to you all today about personas and pathways to build community. Um, but first, a little bit about me. So, um, yeah, I am an OLS mentor. I've taken a couple cycles off, so really happy to be back uh, um, giving you all some content today. 
and um, been a, with o Mozilla Open Leaders specifically as, you know, um, give me just a second. The video is covering my slide, so I can't, <laughs> can't actually see. There we go. Um, I've been a Mozilla Open Leaders mentee, mentor, and then a curriculum lead helper with the Mozilla team. So I can speak from personal experience about the mountains of engagement. I'm currently a Software Sustainability Institute fellow working on bringing usability best practices into scientific software. And then in my day job, I lead user experience design on a national health research program. So personas is one tool we'll talk about today, but um, you have my information if there's more you wanna learn or any questions you have about user experience design in general, please count on me. So by the end of this session, you'll have an understanding of personas and when you might want them a set of example personas from a variety of contexts I tried to pull together for, for the discussion, and then ideas for increasing participation in our open communities. Uh, so I'm gonna open up the chat here. Uh, okay, yes, I just wanna make sure I'm seeing the chat. Okay, so you may have seen a quote like this in your travel so far, but we are all open leaders. And what that means is we design and build projects that empower others to collaborate within inclusive communities. So we're gonna to talk today about the who and the how. Um, it's very difficult to have an inclusive community or a community at all without people. Um, and so, you know, as you're, many of you are building your early stages of your project, you may be feeling like you're one person or you're two people, but two people make a community. I've been told, so we, if you've got more than one person, you're already well on your way. So we wanna talk about some other ways once you grow into your project, how to make space for others. So what are personas? Personas at the, at the core is a tool. It's a tool for understanding and communicating the goals, motivations, and desired end states of real world users. And this is by a person named Alan Cooper, who's um, credited, self-credited, but also by others as the inventor of personas in interaction design. And in the appendix, I have some history if you're interested in learning more about just the origins of personas in general. Um, but when we talk about a tool for understanding and communicating, there are a couple different uh, audiences that, that your personas might be for. So it may be something for yourself that you're building uh, just to gain some clarity for your own project. And maybe um, a persona may be used to uh, communicate to your early community members to really shape out the personas you're looking for. And it may be external supporters like OLS so that you can communicate exactly not just what you're trying to build, but who you're trying to build for. So another maybe familiar canvas if you've, if you've worked in personas uh, in the past, but the intention around a persona is really about what are the needs, motivations, and fears that come from being a part of a community and the community that you're building for. So when you think about who am I building for, it's, I talk about the head and the heart, it's the head and the heart, but it's also the internal and the external. What are the internal factors that are gonna drive someone towards a project? And what are the external factors that may also be driving them towards a project, but maybe away from a project as well? So what's included is a holistic view of, um, you know, what 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 someone needs to be a part of your community, what they want to get out of your community, and then that external environment that may be impacting them. I'm going to go back one slide because I've missed one important thing, one important pitfall is personas can be uh, very useful, but they are very specific to your project. Um, you may be tempted if there's an existing project and you see, oh, that persona looks just like my project. It's a great starting point, but it's really, really important to know the context of your project. So when you think about the persona, it's not just general persona, it's not a characterization of anyone, it's in the context of the specific project that you have. Now, again, some of your early, earlier on in your project development, it may change. Like your personas may change, your com the purpose of your community may change as people arrive, and that is totally cool and okay. These things always change. 
again, they're a tool for communicating. If you're finding yourself not communicating the way you want to with all of your different collaborators, you can update your persona. It's not a fixed, it's not fixed in time. So to illustrate some of the context specific personas, I wanted to show a few examples. So the first example is from um, the uh, inner news, the, the usable uh, tools group, and they're focused on security, their security and um, technology education. And you'll see here, the persona has an overview of the archetype, some specific goals that they're looking for, and strengths and questions. These are all typical persona attributes. But one thing that stood out for me in this persona are threats. So if you're working on a security focused project, it's really important to know what threats are, 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 are your community members potentially facing. So this is an example within the, in the security space. And all these are linked here for you to learn more. The next one I pulled uh, from uh, Reboot in the New York City Open Data Project is more, um, is more data focused. So you can see um, a couple of things that I, I like in my personas. One is a nickname. So here you have the local liaison. And it's just a little keyword to help you give your, uh, um, give your persona a little memorable name. Um, as somebody who works in user experience design, we have dozens of personas. And sometimes, you know, you don't, you don't always remember Alice, who's Alice, you know, it, it's easier to have a qualifier around it, you know, Alice, the academic, that is one of ours. Um, it, it's good to have nicknames to help um, once you get, um, you know, more in your, um, more personas as you build. And then also relevant scales. If you have a set of personas or archetypes of people who you want coming to your community, you may have these, these scales that feel relevant to you. So in this case, we're talking about understanding of open data, the attitude towards open data, and then influence on community. So whatever the scales may feel important to you, there's also examples of maybe if you're working on um, a technical project, you may have someone who uh, technical experience, yes or no, or, or may have um, coding or no coding experience. Same with GitHub. So you can play with scales however, however you would like in your project. And then one sort of shift in persona thinking that I, I've been experimenting with lately is um, in the theme of inclusive personas, practicing removing demographics from your persona work. And so often you'll see um, an image or uh, demographic information and experience information, um, but there's uh, another way to, that, to look at personas that focus on behavior and thinking, um, which is very particular to a task. So this is an example, um, inclusive personas for the um, checked bag experience um, at the airline. And so the, the, the personas are built around like, what is your thinking and behavior towards checking your bag? And that has so much more to do with the task at hand than any other, um, any other factors. So again, these are all different components that you can take and remix. And I know there's um, in your homework, there's templates for you to use, um, but there's, um, yeah, there's lots of other resources to um, expand your personas as you move forward. So then if personas are the who, um, pathways are then the how. So what are contributor pathways? Um, again, from the open leadership framework, it's the journey that users or participants represented by your persona take in engaging with your project from first contact to potential leadership. And I couldn't do a UX presentation without a picture of myself doing UX. Um, so always, always um, down for offline work. Never feel like you have to, you know, get proficient at some online tools. Sticky notes will go a long way. We actually had some of our our, our colleagues come in and, and move the stickies around and say, no, I don't like this pathway. I want to go this way. So you can make these the, the creation of this work very collaborative. 
So um, I was late to the call, but I hear Zana has a, a cooler graph that I can't wait to see later. Um, but my main message about this uh, sort of ladder of, of engagement from discovery all the way through leadership is um, for a while, like, this is some of the stuff that I learned when I was in the um, open leaders training with Mozilla. And what really struck for me in this this ladder or this this process is exactly this idea that it's not just one way. It, it is it is up and down. It is left and right. It is it you can be at any stage at any time, um, and that's okay. I think when 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 I first started out, I'm a, a, a achiever as for lack of a better phrase and I always thought oh everybody wants to be a leader so like how do we all get up to this top rung and the most important thing that I learned was like some people are just super cool where they are like there's no need to incentivize them to move up or over or down you know people might just have an hour an hour a week to answer some bugs and that is that is that any contribution is a good contribution so when I think about pathways, you have chances at each of these steps to, what would I say, not, not necessarily intervene, but to do a pulse check, to see how people are doing. And you'll know once you have, once your community starts to grow, uh, how people are doing um, in these steps. So you may think about um, first contact, we'll take as an example, um, how people first engage with the project or group, their initial interaction. Um, after a while, once you have some information about how that first contact is going, you can start to compare how how different pathways are working for different people. If you know eighty percent of your uh, first contact comes through your um, you know your global sprint day, then do more of that. If it's the other way around, reconsider. So again, the sort of message here is like move yourself up and down. Don't stay too fixed to any one pathway and then double down on where things are working. Um, I I recently, I saw a post, I can't remember where it was, but someone had a million users on their app, but they never talked to a single one of them. They didn't know. They didn't know any of them because people would just come to the main public website and then they would leave. So don't be afraid to reach out to folks, ask, you know, ask for gentle conversation and 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 uh, you know adjust your um, adjust your pathways from there. So then to shift sort of from the this pathways plus personas, I pulled the example from um, the Turing Way has a great example of contributor pathways to show you know how what it would look like for a persona plus a pathway for a contributor. So you have. Um, motivation and experience, sort of this top line paragraph about motivation and experience. And then it gives you more detailed information about how someone may move through your process and may move through your engagement ladder. And I would think to say, let me see. Yes, the turn always comes through. Yes, it, it really does. Um, I was I was tempted to bring all the imagery in as well, but I stopped myself. Um, but you can see here, um, I am a modular thinker. So I like to think that these, each of these components could be reused for any other combination of persona. Um, so that's just another example of um, where motivation and experience are clear, and then where you might be able to see yourself. One thing I mentioned at the top of personas, who your personas are for, like, are they for your community members or are they for your other collaborators or project supporters? This is a good way of reflecting back to your community who you think you're serving. So if you if you go on the Turing way on this particular page, you will see that at the end says, do you see yourself in this persona? Would you like to share more about your experience with the Turing? So even in your sharing of personas, you are inviting feedback. So don't be afraid to take that with you. And just to summarize some of these ideas, I could go on for a while, um, but just to bring it together, and I, I love time for questions, um, personas and pathways for open leaders. Remember personas, they are a communications tool. If they're not communicating what you're looking for, you can always adjust. 
personas are context specific. So make sure that you're really thinking hard about how your project fits into what your community is looking for. And then my favorite pathways are nonlinear. Don't worry about where people are moving. I would even add a, another layer to the mountain of engagement, something about like on pause. Like if you have someone like me who's been away from open leaders for almost a year because I have you know other things <laughs> um it doesn't it doesn't lose my enthusiasm or or commitment or or just gratefulness for this community and i know i can always come back so don't always don't ever feel like because someone has gone for a moment that they're gone they they may just have you know something else going on i try to, i try to share that a lot um and then clear the pathways for contributors at all levels um like i said just always be um listening and changing the way that you're bringing people in. And lastly, continuously hear feedback. It's one thing to listen, it's another thing to hear. I think the most important thing for people that are you know, often in open projects, they may be doing it you know, in their free time and just trying to be helpful. Um, they also wanna be heard. So make sure that if you are offering ways to give feedback, that you also have an ear for acting on it or sometimes because we're all so human we can't act on everything but we can close the loop and so letting people know that they've been heard is is a really important part of this process and I think that's my last slide oh no best slide for last and always be asking yourself who is not here yet who should be and why as we grow these communities we're often thinking about who's at the table and sometimes we have that moment where it's like, okay, we're not getting, we're not getting where we want to get to. Ask yourself why. It's okay. Maybe bring your whole community into it and have an open discussion. Um, but then of course you need a code of conduct. You need a safe place, an inclusive environment to share these things, but constantly be pushing yourself and the community to know who's not here yet, who should be and why. And that I think that's, oh no, not to, more resources are in the deck. Um, I just added some links and then thank you so much. One little pitch is um, the GDS office in London, they print their personas and they have them plastered in their offices. So if you have like a community co-working space or an office or some digital online place, it's just nice to show these in some way um, to remind people who, who you're building with and for. And with that, I will stop my sharing and. Thank you so much. Yeah. Thank you, Meg, for the very insightful presentation. Can we have a quick round of virtual applause? And that, that yeah, I think it talked about quite a few things which were just sticking one after the other. And I especially loved your use of physical sticky notes because I love the analog feel of it. But yeah, we do have a, a couple of questions in the document. Uh, folks, Great. please feel free to enter your questions from line 153. And do you want to take over? Yeah, let's see here. Yeah. yeah okay, if you don't it. have the document open. Okay, yeah, perfect. Yeah, I got it. Is there some sense of minimum expectation on empathy for users for creating? How would, how would you measure this or train for this? You want to broaden usage of personas teaching others how they can be more effective in their communication. Um, yeah, so I um, minimum expectation on empathy. I think one thing that I wanted to, that's in the appendix that I wanted to share is there's also a concept called proto personas, which is developing a persona based on your own assumptions about what you think the community is. And, it's not it's not a substitute for personas, but it's a it's a way to help you get started. So I would say the empathy is you definitely there's no right or wrong answer of like how much empathy or how how you how you want to measure that, but it is important that you check these personas with the people you are building with and for. I think one pitfall sometimes I see people create the persona of like, it's the, it's very obvious who it is. If there's like three people in the community and, you know, it's called like, you know, 
I, I can't think of an example, but like I, I've seen personas made after me and I, and I, that still feels a little bit weird. So I would say create like the archetype of the persona. It, it's meant to be a collection, um, but validate it with others. Does that, does that answer the question? So you're saying we should name our personas Meg? <laughs> meat, meat, meat or hat. <laughs> Yeah. All right, I'll go to the I'll go to the next one here. H how do you know when you have sufficient personas for a particular project? What are concerns for defining too few or too many? That's a great question. I think once you get started, um, we do a lot of like two by two matrices. So if you have like, um, I think the Turing did this of like knows GitHub doesn't know GitHub knows data science, knows data science, or some 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 combination. So if you have at least kind of like a two by two to start with four as a minimum, I I, I might say it's not a it's not a it's not like a um, there's no magic number, but I can also tell you um, you can have sub personas. So if you have four main ones that everyone knows by heart, then you can create you know ancillary or sub personas to get more detail about particular features. So like right now I'm, I'm designing a persona for um, institutional administrators. So we don't have that as our main persona because that's not our main user base, but it is a secondary user. So they can always come up as much as you would like. And then eventually as you grow, there will probably be a moment where someone says, we have 50 personas, we need to do an audit. And then you can just do an audit and consolidate and 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 re refactor. It's just like code. <laughs> um, try not to let it get it too big. Yeah. Let's see this next question. In your experience, is it better to find a single person and work on ways to reach them, focus on them, and then add another person type, or is it better a variety of people? Ah, that's a great question. I think I I am of two minds on this where there are some people, and, and, and there's a lot of evidence about this, that wait to be asked to contribute to something. And sometimes you may know those individuals, maybe they're um, you know in your institution or you've worked with them or you know them even from Twitter, wherever. Um, I, think, I think you should definitely reach out to those individuals. If you think that you have some mutual um, interest in the work that you're working on, definitely and find those find those individuals and also when you're building like the personas focus on more of the the collection and you can always um i guess i would say you can you can sort of abstract from individual persons the the sort of behavior and thinking that you're looking for i really like to be honest i, I really like to be transparent with people uh, like as you're building those so if you're if you're wanting to build something off of a a person like it it should be shared it should be you know hey you came to me through this channel and it really worked well i think i'm going to create a persona around this channel or this pathway um you can also do that as well Let's see all right i think we have the questions. Yeah, thank you so much, Meg. Yeah. And yeah, I think we can, we, uh, we just have five minutes officially. So Yo, do you want to move to closing the call? Yeah, do you want to just um, give people an idea about the silent reflection as homework, yeah. give them the overview, um, but we're not going to do it now because we don't want to run over. Yeah, of course. So we have a silent reflections exercise and basically what we want to do in this exercise is to reflect and think about personas and pathways for inclusion so what was insightful about thinking about those personas and thinking about th those pathways including different people and also reflecting on work that we've already done so pathways that you've already created say knowingly unknowingly and that has worked well and what are the personas you didn't consider and that would be helpful for the project and 
then also like what what are you doing now to provide mentored support to the contributors and how else do we make it more inclusive and give voice to more marginalized people and include everyone so just yeah i think if if we have if we reflect on this and sort of try to implement this in the project that helps a lot and i can speak that from personal experience even though i haven't yet got to the core of it but yeah so just reflecting on that and then noting that down and yeah we can we can share that in in the next calls on the slack anywhere you want thank you thank you so much aman uh, so folks, I'm going to wrap the call up um, and we will be free. Um, this has been an absolute delight. And I'm actually super curious if this time worked well for people despite the short notice, because I don't know, people seemed a bit more alive today. So maybe we want to consider having a later call. <laughs> Um, but anyway, um, if you have the ecopad open, uh, lines 190 onwards, we have some suggestions for links, uh, for possible assignments if you want to dig deeper into personas and how to apply them to your project. These are a lot more optional. If you are like, whoa, RLS, you have a lot of assignments, it's fine to go back to some of the earlier ones and think about those because we want you to start with a stable foundation. So think about your project mission and vision and the open canvas, uh, perhaps before you think about personas. But, um, I think it was really... Uh, uh, shared really well um, he's not here anymore but at the end of the breakout group saying you know if we don't have a shared vision then we can't really um, interact effectively with our community so make sure you focus on those early ones first and it's okay if you count we know that you have lives that you have kids you have school you have work you have everything and of course sometimes it's going to be harder to keep up with it um, they're always going to be waiting in here if you want to come back to them later so don't worry um we have a mentor call next week. If you're on the um, standard schedule, I don't know if that's that's fair to say, but anyway, make sure you're meeting with your mentors regularly. If you show up and you're not sure about an assignment, they can work through them with you as well. Um, and we have a little recommendation around uh, unconscious bias and thinking about it. If you'd like to have a go, line 192. Um, and if you haven't invited an expert, reminder, invite experts. Um, this is a required part of the program that you speak to someone else who's not your mentor and not in the cohort call. Um, and experts know many things. They are cool people. And if you can't find one, uh, ask us in Slack, email us, and we will try and find someone for you who will be awesome and tell you all of the brainy things. So don't worry. Um, all righty. It is 29. Um, anything else, anyone? I oh I've got a heart thank you Diana all right go have your evenings have your mornings have your afternoons it has been a delight being your friend and we will see you again later bye thank you